Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Damon Stanwell Smith, and I'm here with uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Kim Galvez. But um, this is going to be a talk that uh, involves four others as well that are not here. So there's two presenters and four more. So this is the collective um, efforts, if you will, from uh, a group of scientists that work at Viking. As this is the first time I've had the floor, may I also uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizers of IAGLA for inviting us uh, to present uh, and indeed to share in a fantastic community. We're, we're new to the uh, Great Lakes Science community and we're delighted at the welcome we've had. I may also thank uh, Debbie Lee and her colleagues at uh, NOAA GLURL for the opportunity to collaborate and indeed to be here to talk about uh, uh, what we're doing uh, in the Great Lakes. So first of all, just a I'm going to give a little whistle stop tour, a bit of a kind of how and why, who we are, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Kim, who can uh, talk more specifically about the science that's un undertaken um, on the vessels that we have. But first of all, who are Viking? We're a Norwegian shipping line. We're founded in 1997 by a physicist called uh, Torstein Hagen. Um, we have a headquarters in Switzerland, and we take away guests that we describe as the intellectually curious. You could describe them as the retired professor demographic. And we take some 600,000 away a year um, around the world. You may know Viking from the river cruises. We have over 80 river ships. Uh, we have 12 small uh, ocean ships. But most pertinent to this conversation, we have recently built uh, two expedition vessels I'd like to share. Uh, more information about. And in terms of demographic, it's 95% North American, of which is about, of those, 90% are from the US and the other 5% coming from Canada. So it's mostly US taxpayers would be a way of looking at it. So the story starts in 2018 through to 2019. I come from, not from the cruise world, if you will, I actually used to work um, in UN environment. So I come from an academic and, and sort of intergovernmental research background. And I and a few others were headhunted into Viking uh, to, bring to bring into fruition uh, these two vessels. So this is what we were doing in lockdown. Um, and in parallel, we were discussing with partners, including most personally to this conversation, to this um, presentation, with uh, Debbie and colleagues at GLURL about how we can work collaboratively in the different places that we are working in. Uh, we built the vessels uh, in Norway. So it's in the snow uh, during COVID. It was quite a challenging time. And we, of course, had to make sure they could get into the lakes. So uh, Debbie kindly had a lovely segue of showing one of our vessels going through the Welland Canal. Uh, the beam of the ship is 77 feet. The Welland Canal is functionally is 78 feet. So we have six inches either side of the ship going through when we come in to visit you. We come in in May and leave in September, and uh, we have a lot of white paint. So um, just in case, it's, uh, it's like a piston going through um, uh, the locks. And that screen, the image there on the right, was taken last week uh, as Viking Octantis came through the well. And you can see from the bridge, the lock looks a lot smaller than the, um, the beam of the vessel. So these vessels have been designed from the ground up to be both research vessels as well as expedition cruising vessels. Now, I don't have the time and the place to be able to exhaustively go through the many spaces on them, but there is, including a 400 square foot well-appointed laboratory, uh, we have interpretive spaces, we have automated oceanographic equipment that's euphemistically known as a ferry box that's sharing continual data. Um, we have a very nice amphitheater on the after the vessel, very nice learning space. And in terms of, if you will, the toys on the ship, we have two submarines on each ship. These can dive to a thousand feet, can take six guests down plus a pilot, 17 zodiacs, two 40 foot long survey vessels, uh, a dive boat, 19 kayaks. You can get the picture. There's a lot of, a lot of a smaller craft that can, um, that can uh, access remote places. Very significantly, and we're incredibly grateful for the support from NOAA in, in making this happen. Um, we have uh, recently received a congressional exemption to the Jones Act 
to specifically allow scientific activities on these vessels in US waters. So for those of you that are familiar with um, the way that the Jones Act works, we're Norwegian flag vessels, so working in US waters, that limits us quite significantly. But that enables us to undertake science um, on, those, um, on those various assets in US waters. Canada's much more relaxed, and in fact, we can do science in Canadian waters and also uh, can take um, guests down and do things like the diving and so on as well. So what's our science mission? Now, first of all, um, we are continually moving around, undertaking uh, science and monitoring, research and monitoring. Um, I just counted, it's 856 days and counting since Viking Octantis, uh, our first of the two vessels, um, uh, started uh, in Antarctica. And every day, these data are being gathered and activities are undertaken. So you see, we're looking to reimagine what a ship of opportunity uh, can be. So as you see, those three points, gathering and evidence and monitoring data, supporting the mission of our partners, which is very important the way we work. This is about science support and collaboration. This is not us having an autonomous, proprietary, uh, independent um, uh, research mission. And making this uh, research accessible to all. We see one of the key roles is that on every voyage, we have up to 370 very enthusiastic, interested, mostly Americans, that become actively engaged in the work that they're seeing, the research that they're getting involved with. And they take that back. And so that science communication and sharing an understanding of the research that's going on as a core part of uh, the role that we play. And indeed, part of the motivation uh, for us to work in this way. You'll see this is a, a little screen grab on the right of an announcement. So this is in 2020 when, uh, in fact, it was co coincided with um, us uh, our launching the expedition product uh, before COVID and all those other things that were going on um, with a CRADA that we signed uh, with GLOL, which uh, enabled uh, collaborative research. Uh, talking of acronyms, we, uh, when working with colleagues there, the International Great Lakes Opportunistic Observation Program, it's known as IGLU. I'm not sure, I think glamour sounds better, but IGLU's uh, maybe consistent with a polar ship. And we continue to innovate. So we also have other partners. I'm gonna cover the broad sway of partners in a moment. This is research that uh, is undertaken in Antarctica. We also work with Scripps Institute, Institution of Oceanography and their partner, James Craig Vinter Institute in San Diego, and uh, we have um, full genomics capacity on board the vessels. Um, during COVID, we had to develop uh, PCR testing, so we decided to put full PCR testing on 12 of our vessels. Um, at this time, the, the, that capacity it was sort of almost unknown on vessels, so we had to develop the work, developing 12 labs, we trained 70 people, to be able to do thousands of tests every day. We tested every guest and every crew member every day uh, throughout COVID. Um, and so pivoting that to working in the environmental space has been the logical thing to do from an otherwise very challenging time for us all. Um, and so adding the sequencing element onto the PCR capacity is what uh, JCVI have recently done. We first successfully managed to do that in January and we've been refining that process since. So now that capacity sits on the vessels. We're very um, proud of that. We're very pleased that that innovation is possible. And indeed we decided to tell the world just a few days ago. So the press release for this came out three days ago. In terms of our partners, now a core partner in the Great Lakes for us is uh, Noah Glow. Um, we also have a, a collaboration with um, uh, Great Lakes um, Institute of Environmental Research with Mike Mackay's group, um, which we're also from the Canadian side, we're delighted to be able to support um, his work. Um, and we also have an MOU and a work program uh, with the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve in Paris Sound around Georgian Bay. More broadly, uh, we have relationship with Cambridge University in the UK. This is actually where I live and where I work. Um, we have a relationship with uh, Scripps um, in San Diego with the National Weather Service that was actually brokered through our relationship with GLOL, uh, with, with putting up weather balloons. Um, Kim will cover that shortly. With the Norwegian Institute for Water Research and then a variety of Cornell Lab Ornithology, University of Western Australia, ICN, Ocean IT. So the logo cloud here. 
I'd like to add also, we are very much open to new collaboration as well. And so if the upper box is looking at the Great Lakes, we do feel that if we can be of uh, service in a collaborative way, this is why why we're here. We hope that uh, we'll be invited back. Um, we see that we're here for long term, not least building vessels to fit into the Great Lakes was a non-trivial exercise. So we certainly intend to be here every season for the, for the foreseeable. Now at this point, having given a little whistle stop tour of how and why we are, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Kim Galvez, uh, who's the chief scientist on Viking Octantis, who can share more of the brass tacks of what's actually going on on board. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you, Iagler, for inviting us, and thank you to all of our partners and research for being able to present this. Uh, we would love to be able to continue in support of our mission and our partners' missions as well. And so I'm happy to be here as the representative, but of course, this is a team effort. Uh, we have various chief scientists on board. I am one of a team of four uh, that are designed for our two expedition vessels that Damon went into, Viking Octantis and Viking Polaris. And so just to dive straight into our ongoing scientific activities, we promote a lot of research, quality research that's then, as Damon said, accessible, as well as being able to engage our guests during this program. And so we have a variety of different forms and, and projects that are continuously ongoing. That includes eBird observations with uh, the University of Cornell, as Damon mentioned. So through applications, we're able to engage the guests in a lot of citizen science programs, which they're able then to learn about on board partake on board and then bring home as well and continue that kind of data innovation and data collection in support of research all over the world. We also conduct weather balloon launches and I'll go into further detail on that. Uh, we also uh, collect phytoplankton sampling and this is uh, in combination with the Fjord Phyto program that Scripps uh, has, has pioneered and for mostly research in the Antarctic region. But this is a great way that we're able to also engage guests, get them on board, have that impact where they are able to physically collect samples and be engaged in that resources, which then promotes that ongoing enthusiasm for science, that communication and bringing that back home. We also do uh, mapping the seabed with multi-beam processes. I'll go into the different multi-beams that we do carry on board, as well as the baited remote underwater video systems. Now, this is great for habitat ecology. We're looking at different fish populations, abundances, but what gives us the special element is that you're also able to look at the overall behavioral elements in situ. And so by being able to have these kinds of access uh, accessibility, we're able to see what there is and engaging with the software that we use with our rig systems, you're actually able to measure the sizes of any organism that comes into view as well. We also work on the passive acoustic monitoring, and that is not just with the mammals and other animals that live in the oceanic environment and the aquatic environment. We're also looking at the anthropogenic effects of that as well. So looking to see how loud and uh, how much noise production there is underwater and what that might have as implications for the overall environments. We do quite a bit of microplastics research with our ferry box system, and the ferry box is what Damon had also alluded to with what we're able to accomplish uh, in situ with the ferry box system that continuously monitors and senses data as far as oceanographic properties, we're able to reroute some of that water and being able to collect physical samples for microplastics research. And of course, again, like I said before, we have all of our citizen science programs. We have a dedicated space where we're looking to engage as many people as possible. And so we're always happy to uh, innovate and expand our research in what we're capable of doing. And just as Damon talked about before, our genomics at sea program, also referred to as GASP, that recently was announced a couple days ago. And also we uh, have a DGI Mavic 3 multispectral drone, which we're able to collect a lot of high resolution mapping as well. And so going into the data that has been collected already, up until April 30th, we have 1400 sampling events going on. And as you can see in this figure, they span worldwide. And so we're going into the Antarctic Peninsula coming out across the Drake Passage, following the Western coast of the 
uh, South American borders, as well as going through the Panama Canal into the Caribbean Sea, and then following the Eastern Seaboard all the way up into the Great Lakes. We have continuous oceanographic sensory monitor, uh, monitoring data that I uh, talked about earlier with our ferry box system. Currently, we have launched 160 balloon weather balloons uh, in efforts for the National Weather Service, and what we're very happy to contribute towards, because especially while we can do so underway. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, over 1,000 data points collected for all of our citizen science contributions, and that's from within our teams, on board as crew, as well as guests. And this includes, but is not limited to, Happy, Happy Whale, eBird, uh, the, Globe Obser uh, the NASA Globe Observations, and of course, Fjord Fido as well. And so what we're trying to do as part of our goals and missions is to get a story, a complete story of every single one of our station sites that we go to. And this is an example of just one of the sites that we've been able to collect an abundance of data for. And so what you see here in the figures is, again, everyone is uh, probably familiar with what multi-beam looks like. This was collected via a WASP multi-beam sonar system. And uh, we have also been able to collect the oceanographic data, how that's changed over time through the actual season. So we start always at the beginning of the season. We return to various sites throughout the season. So we're able to continuously monitor from beginning to the end of the season. And then, of course, year after year as we go back. So it's not just the spatial data we're looking to collect, but the temporal as well. And so but by being able to have a baseline of spatial data, we can further then our research and look at how we can expand this and what scientific efforts and research needs are at the focus level for that temporal data. We also collected drone imagery, and this is for continuous monitoring of our environment. Uh, we collected Insta360 images around every single one of the smaller penguin rookeries that are around. So you can actually, like the little Google Earth man, walk your way through this site as well, um, especially if you're not capable of doing so. We've collected phytoplankton sampling in this area, ROV imagery. We have targeted submarine dive sites that we also go to for the guest experience, but as well as their, their imagery and their photography that they take also benefits us as far as observational opportunities that we're looking into. And of course, bringing this back now to the Great Lakes, uh, you'll see various data points here, mostly on the Canadian side, because as Damon talked about before, we were not operational on the American or US water side uh, while, up until just recently. But now we do have that science operational capability and we're looking forward to continuing our research and bringing that as well and sharing all of those resources on both sides of the water. And so one of our, our case studies here is a multi-beam. Uh, so we have the Kongsberg EM2040P multi-beam system that uh, we were able to actually operate on at the Canadian side near Killarney. And so we were able to collect uh, multiple swaths around the entrance of the Killarney Channel, as well as near the Okeechobee Lodge, as you can see. So pretty high resolution. We're really excited to be able to see what all of this is uh, alluding to. But what's most significant is that while we were doing this work, um, we had chartered a vessel in order to attach our multi-beam system to. And uh, the captain said, you know, what's really cool is that occasionally on a really sunny day, you're able to see this kind of shipwreck that's over off on the uh, eastern or western side of the Killarney Bay. And we're like, well, let's go find it. Where is it? I don't know, somewhere over there. So five hours later, we were able to find the shipwreck actually that was uh, that they alluded to. Now this is an unregistered shipwreck, and so while collecting this data, we were actually able to implement. You know, we're in the in the process of contacting the Canadian government and, and telling them that this is a shipwreck that's there. And so, with the high resolution multi beam of the EM twenty forty P, you can see we've collected uh, overviews, images, and lateral views, and you can see that the shipwreck is still very well structurally intact. And so we said, okay, great, we have the multi beam, but what does it actually look like? So a week later, back when I was back on Octantis, we took the Blue Eye X three ROV system and were able to collect video and imagery of the shipwreck in itself. And as you can see from the images, it's very structurally sound, and we were hoping to get a name so that we could actually official have registration of this shipwreck. However, as you can see, it's absolutely covered in muscles. There was no opportunity to get a name for it. So all that means to me is now I have to go to the local watering hole back in Killarney and start to get some more information on what's happening there. 
So I take that as a personal responsibility that I need to investigate on. Uh, and so furthering multi-beam work, uh, we are looking at the paleoarchaeological sites that are there. And we're looking at the paleo-Indian archaic uh, uh, evidence of previous known doc uh, uh, opportunities that also exist in these regions. We have the multi-spectral drone surveys that we're always looking at monitoring landscape changes and exploring for further archaeological use as well. And since I'm running out of time, I just want to say the weather balloon launches, we're always monitoring atmospheric trends. We do weekly launches from both ships, and that's a continuous measuring, as you can see, those different measuring uh, opportunities there. And then it's directly transmitted then to the National Weather Service, which then is a publicly forecast, uh, publicly forecasted and then utilized in applications such as Windy and everything where you can then even track the actual weather balloon uh, uh, tracks, transects, as well as uh, look at the data as well. And we notice that there is a lot of science community interest. We know that there are shipwrecks all around. There's over 6,000 that have been estimated that have not even been identified yet. And we know this through news outlets and through publications. And so there's a continued vested interest in what uh, we hope to contribute to, as well as you know early other academic interest in the paleo environment, telling it from the cultural perspective as well. So we're always looking at investing in our uh, community interest, as well as our achieving our own missions, which include missions of our partners and collaborators. And so I just want to leave this last slide up for you. Um, uh, if we have time for questions, but uh, the slide on the left hand side is uh, takes you to a website where you'll be able to visualize our ferry box data that's coming in. And of course, on the right hand side is any more information on our expedition vessels. So thank you very much.